Now that you've been introduced to the principle of orbitals or waveforms in one electron atoms, you're ready to learn about how electrons behave in the rest of the atoms on the periodic table. And in the process, we'll come to understand a little better the source of the chemical behavior of the elements. You may be relieved to hear that we use the same kinds of electron waveforms in multi-electron atoms that we did in the one electron case. Is this really valid? Well, yes and no. Strictly speaking, we ought to have a different set of wave functions for every atom. But since the solutions to the Schrodinger wave equation for multi-electron atoms are far too complex for mere mortals, we've rationalized using the orbitals from the one electron system and adjusting their energies. And this works pretty well. <sighs> Now the principal difference between the electron orbitals in one electron atoms versus those in multi-electron atoms has to do with their energies. Specifically, as you'll recall, in one electron atoms, all orbitals with the same principal quantum number have the same energy. For example, the 2s waveform or orbital has the same energy as the set of 2p orbitals. But this isn't so with atoms containing more than one electron. Let's look at a diagram that depicts the relative energies of orbitals in multi-electron atoms. Now actually this diagram should look quite familiar. Notice that we've depicted here individual shells and subshells, the same kind we saw for the one electron atom. The shell corresponds to the Bohr orbit that is, the principal quantum number in the Schrodinger model. The subshells correspond to the sets of orbitals s, p, d, and so on. The energies of the shells are lined up in essentially the same pattern as the Bohr orbits. Notice that they get closer together in energy as we go up in the energy well. So far, everything is the same as it was in the one electron atom. However, when we look at the subshells, there's a difference. The set of three 2p orbitals is higher in energy than the 2s orbital. Likewise, the set of five 3d orbitals is higher in energy than the set of three 3p orbitals, which are, in turn, higher than the 3s. Now, don't be confused. The orbitals that form a subshell are still the same in energy. We say they are degenerate. Huh? That's not meant to be an insult, it's just a technical term. So let's talk now about which orbital shapes and energies the electrons adopt in a given atom. There's a simple system for building up the electrons in an atom. It follows the common sense principles we've seen before. First, as we put the electrons on an atom one by one, each occupies the lowest energy orbital that's available. Second, two electrons are allowed to adopt the same waveform. We'll talk about why later. And that's it. If we know the pattern of energies and we follow these two simple principles, we can predict pretty accurately the pattern of electrons in almost any atom. So let's try it. First we need to know the pattern of energy levels. And here we come across some disappointing news. Unfortunately, the order of energies doesn't follow the obvious pattern. For example, the 6s subshell is actually lower in energy than the 4f. So what do we do? Well, it turns out there are two handy ways to remember the order of subshell energies. <sighs> We'll look in detail first at a simple mnemonic device and then go back later to the other way. Take a look at this. We list the shells with their subshells line by line. Then we draw arrows down through the list in this pattern. Notice especially that the first two arrows go through single subshells, the 1s, then the 2s, then through multiple subshells. Now if we follow the arrows, we see the correct order of energies. Let's make a list. You see the order is 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, 
6s, 4f, and that's probably about as far as we need to go for now. Well now, the next thing we have to remember is how many orbitals there are in each subshell. That's a really easy pattern to remember. S orbitals come in sets of 1, P orbitals come in sets of 3, and D orbitals come in sets of 5, and F orbitals come in sets of 7. See the pattern? So let's draw a chart showing the ordering of the subshells. Now on this chart we show the order of energies but not the actual values. If we did the latter, all the subshells towards the top would be so scrunched together they'd be unreadable, and that's not helpful. Now that we have this chart, we can use it to show how the electrons fill from one element to the next. As we do so, let's remember that two electrons are allowed to occupy the same orbital. Here we go. As you can imagine, it isn't very convenient to have to draw a diagram to show the electron orbitals occupied in a given atom, so chemists have developed a shorthand way of doing this. We call it the electron configuration, and here's how it's done. For a given element, we make a list of all the subshells which contain electrons in order of energy. It's the same kind of list we saw before, except we terminate the list at the last filled, or so-called valence shell. Let's look at an example. Take sodium. Sodium is element 11. That is, its atomic number is 11. So it has how many electrons altogether? 11. Let's list the number of electrons in each subshell as a superscript. Here we go. Just for reference, I've put our handy mnemonic device on the screen, as well as a list of how many orbitals there are for each kind of subshell. The electrons fill in the order of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. And that's the electron configuration of sodium. Now you try another, namely lead, element 82. Hit pause, do the problem, and then I'll give you the answer. Well, here's the answer. Now you may feel the same way I do, that's an awful lot of pencil work, and it doesn't feel much at all like shorthand. Indeed, since most chemists feel the same way, we've come up with an even shorter hand way of writing the electron configuration. We'll talk about that after looking at the periodic table for a few minutes. Do you recall that I said earlier that there's another way to remember the order in which subshells fill? The information is actually hidden, and not too subtly, in the periodic table. The table is actually organized according to the kind of subshell last filled, what we call the outermost, or valence shell. For example, for the elements in the first two columns, it's the outermost s orbital which fills last. For the elements in the columns with boron through neon at the top, the outermost electrons, that is, the valence electrons, are of the p orbital type. For the elements in the center columns, with scandium through zinc at the top, the outermost electrons, the valence electrons, are of the d orbital type. Now watch this. We start with one electron, which corresponds to hydrogen. Clearly, the electron adopts the 1s waveform. According to our rule, the next electron can also adopt the 1s, which it does in the element helium. 
adding one more electron corresponds to lithium. And you see that lithium is in one of the columns we labeled S. The next electron brings us to beryllium, also an S column. Next is boron, which begins filling the p-type orbitals. We continue on until we hit neon, at which point we have a filled shell, the 2 shell. And notice, by the way, that we've not only been filling the n equals 2 shell, we've been walking across the second row of the table. That's no coincidence. The next element is sodium, and we start filling the n equals 3 shell on the third row. Then magnesium, at which point we've filled the 3s, and we move on to the 3p with aluminum. And on through the 3p, one at a time, then to the 4s. Then, just as our mnemonic device would predict, to the 3d, which we start filling with scandium. Neat, huh? You may have noticed that some of the elements were missing in the periodic table on the last slide. It's those elements at the bottom that seem to hang out in space not connected to the rest of the table. What are the valence electrons for these elements? It turns out that the outermost electrons for these two rows are the F electrons. But here's an obvious question. Why are these elements out there separated from all the rest? There's a simple answer. It's so the table will fit on the page. You see, here's where these elements really fit on the table. I think it's self-evident why this more correct form of the table is not used very often. It's called the long form of the periodic table. It's too long and skinny to fit on the page. So typically, these F elements are shuttled down under the others, and everyone just remembers that they fit in just after lanthanum, element 57, and actinium, element 89. That, in fact, is why the first row of these elements is called the lanthanides, and the second row, which fits just after actinium, is called the actinides. So when we're following the order of electrons filling, they follow this pattern, which mimics the pattern we see in the mnemonic device we learned earlier. Watch carefully. While we have the periodic table in front of us, let's go back to the electron configuration of sodium and see if there isn't a simpler way to write it. Notice that sodium has just one more electron than neon, which has a filled shell. We could just as well write Ne in square brackets 3s1, couldn't we? Where that Ne represents the filled shell configuration of the neon atom. And we could use the same principle when writing the electron configuration of lead, and that would really save us from a severe case of writer's cramp. Why don't you give it a try? Did you come up with something like this? If you did, I think you've got it. I mentioned earlier that there was a reason why two electrons are allowed to adopt the same orbital waveform, so I guess I'd better tell you what it is. You'll recall that each orbital is just the three-dimensional plot of a mathematical function, a so-called wave function, that describes a standing wave. 
Well, each orbital differs from the others in that it has a unique set of quantum numbers. These are just integral constants which fit somewhere into this mathematical function. It turns out that there's another quantized feature of the electron called its spin. And the spin also is associated with a quantum number. The spin quantum number can have a value of plus a half or minus a half. Now the official rule of the game is that an electron around the atom can have any set of quantum numbers it wants, and that means opting any waveform it wants, as long as it doesn't duplicate that of another electron. So for example, if we already have one electron with the set of quantum numbers that puts it into the shape and energy of a 3s orbital, we can have another just like it, except that it has the other spin number. Now spin is often represented by an arrow, up or down. So an electron is often represented by such an arrow to show its spin. With this in mind, let's repeat our depiction of the filling of orbitals, this time showing the spin. 